Thanks. Good morning. Can you all hear me just about? I think it's probably a good time to speak because hopefully you're all uh, refreshed with your caffeine to stay awake at least the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, so uh, it's great to see you all here and I've had some fantastic uh, conversations with some of you um, in the meeting in the bar last night. Um, I thought it'd be quite useful just to uh, talk a little bit about some of the controversies and resuscitation that are out there at the moment. Um, I'm an anesthesiologist by background. I do mostly cardiac anesthesia and also quite a lot of pre-hospital care as well and air ambulance work. Um, but a lot of my time over the last 20 years has been spent um, uh, involved with the resuscitation guidelines for cardiac resuscitation, uh, which you'll all of course be familiar with. Um, and they are all coordinated through ILCOR, the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation. So I've been involved with ILCOR for that period of time and um, led on the ALS guidelines for the 2005-2010 revisions and also for the 2015. So um, partly to blame for any bits of the guidelines you don't like, but I'm happy to take the credit for the bits you do like as well. Um, but um, obviously in, in, the, in the short period of time that I have, I, I, I have unfortunately got time to cover all the controversies and I think it's probably fair to say that um, if you look at the resuscitation algorithm, both the, the basic life support and the advanced life support, uh, probably the entire thing is controversial to some extent, um, not least because we've tried to make it as evidence-based as we can, uh, but the difficulty is there's very little evidence on which to base it, um, and that inevitably means that quite a lot of the guidelines are, are what we think are best practice, and uh, uh, inevitably that means that there's quite a lot of debate about what what is best practice. So um, in the time I've got, um, I, I, there were just some particular areas I wanted to talk about um, uh, in terms of uh, some controversies. First of all, the chain of survival, I just want to say a few words about. Uh, then we're just going to have a quick look at mechanical chest compression. I know that's been covered in, in various aspects by some of the other speakers. Um, a few words about adrenaline, which is probably the main bulk of what I want to talk about. Adrenaline is course quite controversial at the moment, not least because there's been a big adrenaline study that's been published um, that I was involved with. Um, dual sequential defibrillation is all the rage and I want to tell you why it shouldn't be. Um, and um, a few words to finish uh, uh, in, in terms of therapeutic hypothermia. So um, you'll all be familiar with the, with the chain of survival um, and uh, it, it sort of pops up all the time in terms of uh, teaching courses and things. So the chain of survival has, has uh, evolved over the years um, and they're, they're, I appreciate there are a number of iterations but they all essentially have the same message um, in that for someone to have a cardiac arrest and survive neurologically intact, which is what, what the game is all about, then all the links in the chain of survival need to be intact, um, from, from early recognition and call to help, early CPR, early defibrillation if it's indicated, and, and post-resuscitation care. Um, most of you are probably too young to remember, but the very early iterations of the chain of survival didn't have a post-resuscitation care link at the end. It sort of ended here. Um, but there's been a lot of good evidence over the years that post-resuscitation care, uh, if done, done well, can at least double um, neurological survival for patients who get to the intensive care units. That's actually a very important ring at the end. So what, one of the issues, I think, is that um, the chain of survival doesn't really emphasise what's going on at each of the links. And in terms of the potential for survival, um, this has this is a, a obviously the same four links, but redrawn so that the area represents the numbers of patients going through each of the links. And essentially, the, the, the message is, in terms of your patient surviving, you've got a lot more potential to have, uh, there are a lot more potential survivors in these early rings, slightly fewer here, than there are down at this far end post-resuscitation care. So al although we spend a lot of time talking about post-resuscitation care and all the clever things that we can do, if you want to actually increase the numbers of survivors, the emphasis needs to be at this top end of, of, of the chain of survival. Um, and that really is, is involving the public. Uh, in terms of early recognition um, and call for help, and, and certainly um, bystander CPR. And, and systems that have um, focused on that, where um, there's been a lot of public education, um, where ambulance services have improved their um, dispatch CPR, giving CPR instructions over the phone, um, where there's been a lot of effort in 
terms of trying to improve bystander CPR have all consistently shown very significant increases in overall survival. Um, I would love to say, not least because I spend most of my life down at this end of the chain, to, to, to claim similar with these links, but actually um, I, I can't. And, and, and although we've probably made small differences in, in improvement and we'll hear great stories about individuals being saved. Um, overall, there's been very little improvement in survival down at this end of the chain over the last 10 years or so, and, and most of the improvements have come at this, this end. So this is the end we, we really need to be concentrating on um, if we're going to uh, make, make some big differences. And, and of course, um, there, there's lots of clever technology now in terms of uh, trying to link all these public access defibrillators with, with mobile phones, having networks of bystanders who can be alerted and, and, and able to respond. And and um, uh, get CPR going and bystander CPR going before the ambulance service arrives. Um, and even um, bystander CPR, even performed badly, can, can at least double, if not treble, the chances of someone's survival. Um, and I, I can't claim that about adrenaline or uh, many of the other interventions that we've been discussing. So bystander CPR and, and early defibrillation of indicators are really the key things in terms of, of patient survival. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to drift slightly towards those smaller links in the chain of survival um, in terms of uh, some of the controversial uh, aspects. And um, mechanical chest compression, I'm sure you're all familiar with. I'm sure uh, most of you have, have uh, used it um, out in, in the field or, or in hospital. Um, and the, the, the background to it is obviously manual CPR can be done well, but it's often done badly. We know from, from a lot of studies it's done badly, um, both in terms of rate and depth of compression, humans fatigue, um, and uh, uh, again, there are lots of good studies showing that, that the quality of CPR declines rapidly over time unless you change rescuers around. Um, so mechanical chest compression devices have all been um, invented um, to, uh, to try and take over from humans and improve the, the quality of CPR. Um, there are a number of uh, devices out there. Um, I, I only show these just as examples. These are probably the two main ones that are out, out there in the, in the field. Uh, and like so many things in, in medicine, the, the animal work showed very uh, significant um, uh, success rates in terms of improving blood flow compared with manual chest compression. Um, and it was thought that um, it was going to be fairly obvious that uh, if this was all translated into uh, clinical practice, it was bound to make an improvement in, in, in outcome. Um, the devices work slightly differently. There, there's the sort of thumper type, which mimics obviously chest compressions. Uh, the autopulse device is a sort of circumferential thing which compresses the whole chest. Um, but both, certainly in, in the lab, have been shown to uh, produce quite reasonable forward flow um, during CPR. Um, so um, the manufacturers all claim that their devices are better than anyone else's. Don't don't, don't believe that. There's there's no evidence that any of them are any better than any others. Um, now I I don't want to blind you with data and 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 whatever. So I I don't look at any of the numbers. Just look at these little pictures and triangles. I thought thought you could cope with triangles at this time of the day. So um, th these are forest plots, which hopefully you're, you're vaguely familiar with um, at least. But um, essentially. Um, uh, Anything to this side of the line favours manual CPR. Anything this side of the line favours mechanical CPR. And, and the reason I, I think it's quite nice to look at these sort of graphs is that it gives you a, a, a spread of the results and the confidence intervals that are out there so that you can get a sort of rough idea how, how good the evidence is or not um, for whether these devices have worked. So there have been a number of studies looking at the Lucas device. Um, and essentially, you can see that uh, if you add them all together, uh, you get this little triangle here which sort of sits on the on the odds ratio of one. So there's, there's no evidence in, in terms of the Lucas device um, that it makes any difference in terms of outcome. Um, and uh, in terms of the autopulse, well, essentially the important thing is that triangle still straddles this, this one line. Um, so there's statistically, um, there's no difference um, with or without the autopulse in terms of outcome. If you add everything together, you, you get this little triangle down here, which again just straddles one. There's some suggestion that um, outcome may be better in terms of um, manual uh, chest compressions compared with mechanical. There's a lot of debate about why these studies really fail to show any improvement with, with uh, uh, mechanical chest devices. Um, some of the studies may have had quite significant confounding variables. Um, one of the things that's thought possible to explain the, the lack of benefit of 
uh, mechanical is that in terms of the studies, the paramedics will train to do very good manual CPR. Um, so um, that's not really the, the real world in that often manual CPR isn't, isn't that good. Um, the other reason that certainly in one of the studies was thought to be a factor is that uh, the paramedics out there li like the, mechani the, the mechanical devices so much they were putting them on everyone they came across, even those with rigor mortis. And of course, if you enter patients into the study with rigor mortis, it doesn't help your mechanical chest compression group in terms of the outcome. So there's a lot of debate that's gone on. I think at the end of the day, though, um, mechanical chest compression has certainly got um, a, a, a role to play during CPR. I'm mean, Personally, I'm a big fan of mechanical chest compression uh, devices. I think they transform the management of a cardiac arrest in terms of being, be, having the chest compressions going continuously and, and, and not stopping. Um, and it allows you to focus on, on, on the key important things of the arrest in terms of determining the cause and, and, and the appropriate therapy. So I'm a big fan of mechanical chest compression. Um, and, and of course, in the pre-hospital environment, it comes into its own in terms of uh, being able to carry on CPR while you're moving the patient around. So it's, it's here to stay. There's still a lot of debate. The guidelines are a bit ambivalent about it, saying use it if you want to, but you don't have to sort of thing. Um, and, and, and I think because these studies have taken so much investment um, financially, I can't see any more big studies coming along uh, in the near future. So I think we're probably here to stay with the data, the data that we've got. So um, moving swiftly on, um, I just wanted to say a few words about adrenaline, um, which um, is, is probably of all the things we're going to talk about, perhaps the most controversial. Um, adrenaline's been used for um, well, uh, if, if you're a dog, it's been used for 100 years in cardiac arrest. If you're a human, it's, it's 50 years. Um, but um, I'm not on, the, on the face of it, it, it makes a lot of sense with adrenaline to, to use adrenaline for cardiac arrests. It's very powerful chronotrope, so it increases the heart rate. It's very powerful arnotrope in terms of in, it's increasing the, the, the force of contraction. Um, and it makes perfect sense um, that... Uh, uh, that, that um, it might help in, in terms of cardiac arrest. Um, the dose of, of adrenaline that was originally recommended in the 1953 guidelines um, was one milligram, and it hasn't changed. And that's because there's really been very little evidence. So um, many of you will be aware of the uh, Paramedic 2 that um, uh, was published um, at the end of last year, year before. Sorry, time's going very quickly. Uh, just over 18... Just, just about 18 months ago or so. Um, and this was a, a, a big um, UK randomised study um, with involving about half the UK ambulance services um, where about 8,000 patients were recruited. Half were randomised to uh, placebo, which was essentially saline, and half were randomised to adrenaline, so the standard one milligram every other cycle. Um, and uh, it uh, was a big study which came to the following conclusion. So in terms of return of spontaneous circulation, um, about two thirds who had adrenaline um, got uh, ROSC. Um, relatively few in terms of the placebo group who had adrenaline got ROS. So there, there's very little doubt, and this is consistent with one or two other studies, um, that um, adrenaline seems to improve your, your the chance of getting return of spontaneous circulation. Um, in terms of survival to 30 days, um, you can see that um, uh, not quite as marked, but certainly um, about 50% more people um, had survived 30 days in the adrenaline group uh, compared with the placebo group. Um, in terms of favourable neurological outcome, which is really the key endpoint, and, and, and what most resuscitation studies now use as the primary endpoint, is favourable neurological outcome. Um, there were slightly more survivors with favourable neurological out outcome in the adrenaline group compared with the placebo group, but essentially no significant difference. Um, just before I move on, I should, should mention, you might think these numbers are very low in terms of 2.2% of 1.9. Um, in, in terms of the data in the study, only those in cardiac arrest who got on to need adrenaline were actually entered into it. So in terms of the 8,000 recruited into the study, 600 survived, but were not entered into the study because they got ROS before adrenaline was actually given. All right, so it's not that in the UK we're really bad at resuscitating our patients. I just <laughs> I don't want you to think that. It's just that these are th this, this just represents those who got as far as needing adrenaline, which of course is why the numbers are so much smaller, okay? Um, 
and then there's been a lot of debate about this because uh, in terms of poor neurological outcome, um, there were quite a few more in the um, adrenaline group compared with the placebo placebo group. Um, so uh, essentially 39 uh, in the adrenaline group compared with 16 in the placebo group. So these numbers are relatively small and this is from 8,000 patients that are entered into the study. All right. So initially, I mean, the, the, the press picked the study up when it was reported and, every, and they, they were saying, oh, adrenaline worsens, you know, will, will kill you and, uh, in, in terms of brain function and things. But actually in terms of numbers needed to treat, this represents for every 120 patients given adrenaline, one will end up um, uh, with, with, with worse neurological outcome. All right? And overall, there were more, more survivors with good neurological function. So the, the debate is whether you want to avoid having patients with worse neurological outcome, or whether you're going to focus on improving neurological outcome for, for, for a greater number of patients. So there's been quite a lot of debate about that. So if we look at these little little uh, diamond shapes again. This, is, this has just been published actually um, in, in terms of a meta-analysis of all the adrenaline studies ever done. Um, adrenaline for cardiac arrest. Um, there, are, there were three studies that were uh, included in looking at ROSC and it, it's pretty clear in terms of odds ratios you're 2.86 more times likely to get ROSC um, uh, with adrenaline than without. So as, as I say for ROSC that's pretty good. Survival to hospital discharge you are more likely um, with adrenaline um, to get survival to hospital discharge. You can see the odds ratios are 1.11 to 1.86. So um, it may not be a great effect, but you are certainly more likely to survive to hospital discharge. That doesn't categorize you in terms of your neurological status. Um, but this does. And overall, um, with adrenaline, um, sorry, it's a bit small here, but uh, essentially if you look at the odds ratio, 0 0.9 to 1.62, there's no evidence that adrenaline improves your neurological outcome. Uh, because this doesn't this doesn't cross one, um, so uh, giving adrenaline does not result in in greater numbers of patients overall when you do the meta-analysis um, with with better neurological outcome. So there's a lot of debate now in terms of the guidelines whether whether we stick with what we're doing with adrenaline, whether we need to change it or whatever. One of if if you look at all the, all the other data that's out there. Um, it, it seems fairly clear to me at least, although maybe not everyone who writes the guidelines, um, that um, I, I think probably ad adrenaline is a good drug, but we give too much of it. Um, and there there's been, have been some very good animal studies actually, um, where animals have their equivalent of one milligram of adrenaline. Um, and um, researchers have looked under a microscope at uh, microcapillaries in the brain. And you can see that when you give the adrenaline, you get so much intense vasoconstriction that the red cells just stop moving because the, 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 the vasculature has constricted so much um, that it actually stops the, 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 the blood flow. And it's probably that that's, that's causing the uh, um, inability of adrenaline to improve neurological outcome, because it, it might get the heart restarted, but it's actually um, worsening um, oxygen delivery to the brain. So um, a little often, I think, is probably the key. And certainly, again, animal studies have shown that um, giving small doses more frequently improves cerebral blood flow much much more than what the, the regime we use at the moment. In fact, the best way of improving cerebral blood flow is, is to give an infusion. And I know certainly in the States, one or two EMS systems are sticking the adrenaline into a bag of saline and just running that as a slow infusion during, during the arrest, which I, I personally think is a very good idea. Um, there's also some evidence that giving adrenaline early um, helps, giving adrenaline late worsens the outcome. That, that window at which it it moves from being beneficial to harmful. It's probably quite quite soon in the arrest. Some studies, 10 minutes, certainly 20 minutes. And, and in practical terms, it's often difficult to get to patients and give them the first dose of adrenaline so quickly. So there's, there's quite a lot to, to debate. Um, I don't think the guidelines are going to change very much for the next iteration in 2020. Um, the guidelines ha have a sort of rule that unless there is evidence, we won't change anything. And unfortunately, the evidence the guidelines now require is very high in terms of prospective randomized studies. Um, and common sense and animal studies and uh, all that sort of thing are, are out the window. Um, so um, I, I think there's going to be no more than this evidence for the guidelines revision in 2020. And I, I, I fear that we're going to end up carrying on doing what we're doing, which I don't think is, is, is the right strategy. Anyway, I'm going to say no more. Please don't Twitter that, otherwise I'll be sacked from the Guidelines Committee. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, so moving on very quickly then, um, I just wanted to uh, 
talk very quickly about dual sequential defibrillation. Hopefully most of you will recognize that as VF. Um, uh, as a cardiac anesthetist, I see quite a lot of it for real. This is a heart in VF. Um, I don't normally pick my video camera up to film VF when I see it, um, but um, this patient's on bypass, so um, the heart, unusually for VF, is being perfused with warm oxygenated blood, so that'll carry on for some time. Um, but you can see it's been described as looking like a bag of worms. The heart's all contracting in a, in a completely random way. Um, so in terms of dual sequential defibrillation, um, I expect many of you have come across that. Some of you may even have used this in clinical practice. And th the reason being that conventional defibrillation um, uh, often uh, doesn't work or patients go back into VF. So this is some, some interesting data from, from Rudy Costa's group um, looking at the numbers of VF episodes in, in, in in cardiac arrests um, of al almost 500 patients. And you can see, actually, it's pretty unusual to have a single episode of VF. Um, it's very common for patients to have uh, significant leap uh, for, for to go back into VF after they've, they've had VF before. Um, and in fact, about a third of patients end up having five or more episodes of VF. So VF is actually quite common. So once you've shot your patient back into a fusing rhythm, um, you need to uh, just be very aware that you may see more VF um, as you carry on your resuscitation care. So dual sequential defibrillation, double sequential defibrillation is sometimes call, called, essentially involves putting on two pairs of pads, uh, either side by side like this for anterior lateral, or some people describe doing um, front to back with one pair and anterior lateral with, with, with the other. Um, and then you have two defibs and you fire them more or less at the same time. And there are all these case reports in the literature about how fantastic it is and it's how it saved their patient after 10 conventional shocks. The problem is, if you do dual sequential defibrillation, it doesn't work. You're not going to write it up, are you? So in terms of publication bias, you end up with all these stories in the literature about the old patient here and there where dual sequential defibrillation has worked. And none of the patients where it hasn't worked get, end up getting reported. So um, more electricity is not necessarily better. Um, so if I was going to set up in business as a, as a defib manufacturer, I'd, I'd make a defib that, that delivers 1,000 joules. Because you could say that it's the only defib on the market that is guaranteed to terminate VF. All right? Because it would. Um, and so terminating VF is not necessarily the, the, the end point. You know, 1,000 joules would probably put patients into asystole, wouldn't it? Um, so putting two pairs of pads on and delivering 360 joules or whatever does not necessarily mean um, that you're, if you get the patient out of VF that you've done them any benefit if they're in asystole or if the heart's been damaged so much by the electricity that even if it goes back into a perfusing rhythm, um, it's going to be able to contract. Um, uh, back to these little Darman things again. There's there's relatively little in the literature outside case reports. There are a couple of sort of cohort studies, um, and um, recently there's been a meta-analysis looking at those, essentially showing that there, there's no evidence for um, a dual sequential defibrillation uh, or not. And personally, I, I if if you look at dose response curves for uh, for defibrillation, which I haven't got time to go into now, unfortunately, where where we sit with our current therapies for 200-360 joules, is is sort of in the optimal dose range, and if you start going over the top of that, certainly in animal studies, uh, there's evidence that outcome is worse because you're, you're actually damaging the myocardium. Um, the other warning f for those of you who do like using dual sequential defibrillation, there has been the first case report, and I suspect not the first, to, to appear in literature that there would like to be more, where um, two defibs have fired, and essentially one defib has damage the other defib by, by passing its current in, in back into the other defibrillator and has completely wrecked the second defibrillator. And they didn't realize that until they went to the next VF arrest where their defib wouldn't work. So just be aware, those of you who think that it might help your patients, that um, certainly the manufacturers are not great fans of it um, for that reason alone. Uh, and there is no clinical evidence at the moment. There is a study going on in the States, though, so maybe we, we might know in, in the next few years. Um, my personal theory about why dual sequential defibrillation might work for the odd patient is that um, I think pads are often put in the wrong places. I think uh, we, we, we heard a comment about that from one of the other speakers this morning. Um, uh, here is um, a, a patient uh, being treated by London Ambulance Service, um, and uh, here is their um, apical pad over their spleen. Um, and um, obviously, the guidelines are um, 
you would, would ideally have the pad up here. Here's, here's a lady on some TV program um, encouraging people to use defib. So you can see again, you can see where the pad is here. Um, you know, good, good on her for trying to encourage people to get defibs. But if you're going to put your apical pad down here, um, it's it's going to be a bit of a waste of effort. So I, 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 I think the most important thing in terms of defibrillation is to make sure your pads in the correct place. I, I often think with dual sequential is, is that by putting on a second pair of pads, you actually end up putting them in a better place than your badly placed first pair. So I think you probably need to do no more than just make sure that your pads are, are, are in an optimal position. And it's this pad that's the culprit, really. Um, this pad generally tends to get stuck in the right place. This one, um, I mean, the guidelines say mid-auxiliary line, um, roughly level with where the V6 electrode would go. So it's right around the side. Um, the, the aim is to have the heart s essentially between the two pads. And, and, and lots of people put it down here. And, and I think the heart's somewhere up here. Um, so uh, current pathways down here just catch the edge of the heart and don't work. So anyway, that's, that's my thoughts about dual sequential defibrillation. Moving very rapidly on, and we've got a real expert following on from me, so I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but um, therapeutic hypothermia, uh, has sort of come and gone a little bit in terms of um, resuscitation. Um, again, like so many things, uh, animal studies were early animal studies were quite promising. The the main aim of therapeutic hypothermia is to protect the brain, um, and certainly for out of hospital cardiac arrests, um, neurological injury is the, is the commonest cause of, of of death, and it's it's the brain that is particularly at risk for out of hospital cardiac arrests, usually because of the quite long down times. Um, not quite the same for in hospital cardiac arrests, um, where multi organ failure and cardiovascular issues tend to be predominant. Um, but, but certainly even in, in hospital, a neurological injury is, is, is relatively common. So, so um, therapeutic hypothermia has sort of aimed at trying to minimise neurological injury. Um, the, the, the very first study, um, the, the HACA trial, hypothermia after cardiac arrest, concluded that um, hypothermia was, was neuroprotective and, and demonstrated that there were better there were greater survivors in the in the cooling group and sort of based on that that it, it found its way into the guidelines the problem with the original hacker study was that the control group where there was no cooling were just left to drift um, and without any temperature management and after cardiac arrest uh, it's almost inevitable that you end up with an inflammatory response and that inflammatory response causes a paraxia and pyrexia, we do know, is really bad for your brain. Really, really bad. And there was a suggestion that actually it wasn't the cooling that was the benefit. Um, it was the fact that the outcome was worse in, in, in the control group who were just left to become pyrexial. So subsequently, there have been a number of studies, um, uh, which I, I haven't uh, really got time to go into a great deal of detail. Um, this meta-analysis was published at the end of last year, which is the sort of late, latest where we are. Um, again, um, you can see this diamond crosses one, so essentially um, no evidence that it's of any great benefit. You could argue, I hate the word a trend towards, um, because it sort of slightly ignores all the statistical things. But anyway, I'm going to say it. There is a trend towards uh, hypothermia. Um, Personally, I'm, I, I am a great believer in hypothermia. I mean, I, as a cardiac anaesthetist, we use hypothermia routinely in all our cases going, undergoing bypass, where we cool them to about 33 degrees centigrade just for neuroprotection. Um, if we don't or can't do that for any particular reason, it, it, it really does risk neurological injury in, in, in patients. Now, that I appreciate that's a controlled elective situation. It's all very different in cardiac arrest. Um, all, all I would say is that there is no real evidence that cooling harms your patients in terms of neurological function, and that you know there is some evidence that it, it may be of benefit. Um, so the current guidelines at the moment, um, in terms of cooling, are, are to avoid pyrexia, um, and you can't do that just by letting the, the, the patient's temperature drift. All right. Um, Usually, paracetamol and tepid sponging are not effective in, in terms of maintaining the, the, the core temperature below 37.5 degrees centigrade. So um, even if you don't believe in cooling, um, you, you 
we'll probably need to be a little bit more proactive than just paracetamol and tepid sponging in terms of keeping that temperature down. If you do believe in, in cooling, then the guidelines are essentially choose a temperature between 32 and 36 um, and um, cool the patient to that for at least 24 hours. Personally, I tend to go at the lower end of, of, of that um, and cool my patients for at least 24 hours, sometimes a little bit longer if they've had long down times. Um, but I think the, 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 the main thing is to avoid the pyrexia. And, and I, I think one of the inadvertent issues that, that has crept up at the moment is that people have read the guidelines and said, oh, we, we don't need to cool anymore and we won't bother. And actually, lots of patients have now started drifting into that pyrexial range, which is a disaster for their outcome. And that's what the guidelines never intended. So you, you, you could say you don't believe in cooling, but hopefully uh, you don't believe in pyrexia either. Um, and, and you need to avoid that, which is probably the most important of those two factors. So um, that's a very quick gallop through through some of the more controversial things. I was going to talk about airway things as well, but I won't because A, you've probably heard enough of me talking, and B, I think Richard Lyon is going to cover that in his talk as well. Um, the next iteration of the guidelines, certainly for Europe, is out in 2020. So it's not that far away, is it? That's next year. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what comes out. I suspect there aren't going to be any major changes, as I say, because the guidelines committee have now set the bar so high for changes that we struggle to get any research that, that crosses that bar and allows us to use it for, for uh, changing the guidelines. That in itself is another whole area for debate. Um, the guidelines, the current guidelines and any future ones are available to download for free on, on the European Resuscitation Council website. Um, so um, I think they're quite a good read. Um, but um, if you want to download them, that's, that's where to get them. So thank you very much for your time. I'm very happy to take any questions, comments, um, abuse, or whatever you've got for me in terms of the guidelines. I'd really value some feedback. Thank you. All right, we have the first questions already. Hi. Uh, if you think uh, adrenaline is po uh, possibly harmful, do you think it would be better to give it as a muscular injection to have a more like battery diluting effect into the body than IV? Um, I, I mean, the, pro the problem with giving IM adrenaline is that it causes such intense local vasoconstriction that the uptake is really poor. And certainly during a cardiac arrest anyway, when you've got very poor muscular blood flow, give giving adrenaline by that route probably wouldn't really result in very much getting getting anywhere where it needs to get. And if, if, if you want to give it quickly, and, and I mean, intraosseous needles. Yeah, OK. Yeah, um, I, I, don't, I don't think I am the I am route in a cardiac arrest would really achieve any significant levels of adrenaline in, in the circulation because of that intense vasoconstriction that it causes locally and the fact that there's not very much local blood flow anyway. How's it going? Uh, fascinating talk. I had a question about sort of you've been doing this long enough now that you've kind of seen sort of the swings in yeah. in uh, ILCOR. Um, what is your sense of why have we gotten to the point where now the expectations regarding evidence have kind of crept up to the point where now we're basically sort of mm. paralyzed regarding, mm. you know, shifting our therapies? We, we, we are absolutely paralyzed with the guidelines, yeah. Um, I, th there are a lot of academic purists involved in the guidelines process. Um, and um, we've moved, I mean, it, it's quite appropriate that all the, all the research papers are scrutinized because we don't want to be making recommendations based on papers that are flawed, um, you know, where, where, where there are clearly issues with the conclusions that have, have come out. Um, currently, the guidelines process use, uses the grade system. Um, which you, you may be familiar with, um, which is a sort of systematic way of, of working through a paper and looking at all the possible um, issues with it. Um, and inevitably, in any paper, you're going to pick up um, problems um, uh, which, which may limit the, the validity of the conclusions. Um, but I, I, I personally think that ILCOR um, have slightly lost their way in terms of uh, what they're trying to achieve. I mean, I, I, w I went to a meeting last year in the States with, with most of the EMS directors from, from, from the States, and where they've introduced a bundle of care, um, which includes things like impedance threshold device, not in the guidelines, 
adrenaline infusions, not in the guidelines, mechanical chest compression, not in the guidelines, pre-hospital cooling, not in the guidelines. They have almost all, without exception, seen doubling in their survival rates from 10 to 20 percent. So the guidelines can't claim that. There's been very the systems that are purely follow the, the resuscitation guidelines have really seen very little improvement in outcome. Whereas the EMS directors have said, oh, well, we're going to use all these other things. And they've seen a doubling in their survival rates. So I know which system I'd prefer to be treated in if I had my cardiac arrest. Now, in terms of all those things I, I, I listed in, with that bundle of care, we don't know which ones are more beneficial than others. Um, but, but certainly as a package, um, it seems pretty clear to me that they're, they're uh, going quite a long way to improving outcome, which we haven't managed to achieve just with the guidelines, how we've done them. So, um, yeah, I, I, I personally uh, am frustrated with where we've got to with the guidelines. Um, and I... I'm not sure whether we're going to be improving from that. I, I, it may be that as they see people getting frustrated and doing their own things, that they, they, they may sort of lower the bar a little bit because, um, you know, when you've got animal studies which show such intense vasoconstriction um, and uh, a reduction in cerebral oxygen delivery with one milligram of adrenaline, um, to say that we're, we're just going to carry on doing what we're doing because there's the, the evidence isn't out there, is, it seems illogical to me. Um, because common sense, I think, is 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 quite powerful uh, sometimes, and and so, so animal studies and things which they don't either they don't take into account of either. So. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, following the paramedic two trial, mm. uh, Dr. Böttiger in Germany posted on Facebook that he doesn't believe the trial is applicable to Germany because Germany is physician-based EMS and um, that he believes that uh, the German system uh, with a four-man team and basically any arrest is superior and therefore uh, the results don't work in Germany. I actually wrote an open letter to the ERC asking for a statement on this, but they didn't get back to me on that, I'm afraid. But maybe you have a thought on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no twittering, all right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's right. See, Bernd, I, I know Bernd, we're a very good friend. Bernd's the Director of Research for the ERC. Um, I think you need to be very careful when you make those sort of statements because this wasn't an issue about whether it's a paramedic or doctor that did it. Um, our, you know, in, in, in the UK, um, generally our paramedic teams are very well trained, deliver a, a you know, good standard of ALS. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure why the vasoconstriction that adrenaline causes is going to be any less in the hands of a doctor than a paramedic. So I think that statement's garbage. <laughs> Hi, uh, Phil, Phil Spinella, St. Louis. Uh, great talk. My question is, uh, is ILCOR going to focus on hemorrhagic shock as a cause of cardiac arrest uh, to focus on? At least, I haven't looked at the guidelines in the mm. past you know, eight to ten years or so. Uh, but in the past, hemorrhagic shock was not a focus. Correct, uh, yeah, yeah. And now there is, I think, some data that is high quality enough that ILCOR can use. Uh, because as you mentioned, you know, preventing the cardiac arrest is the best way to mm. improve outcomes. No, absolutely, and with yeah. hemorrhagic yeah. shock from all cause, yeah. traumatic or not, yeah. um, it's, it's been a big gap uh, for me over the years. I'm just wondering, is ILCOR going to... Uh, I, yeah, focus I on hemorrhagic shock. It, it probably will cover it, but not perhaps in the, in, the, in the depth that it needs to. I think ILCOR has generally focused on cardiac-related causes of cardiac arrest, and, and so mo most hypovolemic shock is related to trauma. So it, it does. I mean, it does have trauma guidelines, but I, I don't think it sees trauma as its primary raison d'etre. Right, but that's almost that's what I said. I don't mean just trauma. People have uh, severe hemorrhagic shock. Actually, it's more common to have non-traumatic causes of hemorrhagic shock than it is to have traumatic hemorrhagic shock. It's a 60-40 split. It may be uh, in the States, perhaps not in my country. Uh, perhaps. Um, <laughs> regardless, I, it's, it's a big mistake. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. I think there are so many lives that can be saved. No, I, I, I will bear those comments in mind. I think, I think we could usefully you know, go into that in more detail. I mean, blood fills the yeah. heart, yeah. right? How is it not yeah. cardiac related? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, no. Marvelous. I have a question. Oh. Um, you talked about how uh, 
cardiac arrest and adrenaline outcomes. Cardiac arrest is a, a pretty wide definition. I mean, um, how do you think you could design studies to actually check whether and what type of cardiac arrest adrenaline would be helpful in? Well, I th the, the problem with, uh, well, any, any studies, including those looking at adrenaline, is that the, the, the primary endpoint really needs to be intact neurological survival. And which involves having to get large numbers of patients into your studies. So which that's why the adrenaline study had to recruit about 8,000 patients. Um, so the, the, the first challenge is, is being able to have funding and infrastructure to be able to recruit that many patients in, in, into a study. Um, there are some further adrenaline studies planned. Laurie Morrison um, in, in in uh, North America is planning on looking at doing a study following on from the paramedic two study now looking at different dosing schedules with with adrenaline I'm not aware at the moment that they've decided what dosing schedules they're, they're going to use but they'll end up needing to recruit similar numbers so there will be some more data coming out in the future but it's a slow laborious process which involves huge numbers of patients and you know, it takes sort of five years in terms of the cycle from conception to to conclusion of the study so it's um it's I, I think we're going to see m that more and more with cardiac arrest studies in terms of needing large numbers to try and answer some of these questions but it's not easy oh, two more questions and then we'll introduce the next lecturer thank you for this uh, very interesting talk talking about uh, hypothermia therapeutic hypothermia I, uh, I'm also a, bel a believer of uh, hypothermia to improve the outcome of uh, cardiac arrest patients. Yeah. And we know this from accidental hypothermia. Always when uh, the cardiac arrest uh, occurs in a hypothermic patient, the outcome is quite good. Mm. Uh, the tricky point is that in a cardiac arrest, you have already the cardiac arrest, and then you start cooling. Yeah. And all the, <coughs> all the uh, studies so far, they are uh, made with patients where uh, the uh, post rosc cooling. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, thought about the prior rosc cooling of the patients during the CPR before rosc? Yes, and that's, a, that's a very interesting point. The <laughs> essentially, I, I think all the studies that are ongoing are, are looking at post rosc cooling. But I think if if we are to see any benefit it may well be that we're doing it too late and we need to look at doing it during the cardiac arrest i think the part of the problem during the cardiac arrest is that because blood flow is quite limited in the surface tissues arms and legs and things it's it's quite difficult with topical cooling um in in there have been one or two small studies that have been reported where cooling has been attempted during cpr and again, that that that, well, that was using cold IV fluids, um, but um, there is some evidence that cold IV fluids, two liters of cold saline, are not particularly good for a failing heart uh, in terms of pulmonary edema and things when you get it restarted. So, I think it, it's the technical side that's limited the ability to to actually implement some of this cooling, um, rather than people not not having looked at that stage. I think if we had the technical ability to do it. Um, so maybe like with rather than Reboa, we ought to be putting in a cooling catheter during the arrest. Or maybe you stick a cooling catheter on your Reboa device as well. Um, and, and perhaps look at doing th through there. But I, I, I do think that's a very good point in terms of having perhaps to move it earlier if we're to optimize any benefits from cooling. Um, could you please uh, just repeat um, the button? Uh, the bundle, oh, the bundle uh, of care uh, of measures, you know, that yeah, you felt yeah. actually make an outcome that are uh, outside the current guidelines. Yes, absolutely. So it's, I mean, it's a little bit variable depending on which EMS systems you look at. But generally, the bundles of care that are being introduced include impedance threshold device, um, mechanical chest compression, um, adrenaline infusions. Um, through just in a bag of saline, uh, and and uh, targeted temperature management, um, and so it, trying to cool the patient in the pre-hospital setting, even if that's with bags of ice or whatever. Now, a, a lot of those bundles of cares, care have also been implemented in conjunction with the 
EMS systems, improving the telephone scripts, identifying cardiac arrests more quickly, encouraging bystander CPR, so improving CPR, bystander CPR rates, also working with their local hospitals to get patients to the cath lab, improving that flow through the cath lab, and so on. So it's not, it hasn't, to be fair, always just been that bundle of care. But when, when you join it all up together, it's, it's had very remarkable results. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.